entitled Dad Weaponizes His Son for Sympathy and Money. Hey everybody, first time posting, but I've been listening to a bunch of those narrated posts over on YouTube while I work and I wanted to share some experiences from a few years ago. These mostly involve me, my wife, a former friend of mine Aaron, and his son Ethan. These are set across a six or seven year period. I have way too many of these, but consider these the greatest hits. Shortly after my mom kicked me out at the age of 17, the day after Christmas, after crashing with my best friend's family, I moved into my first place. It was an absolute slum, but it was only $200 divided by mo total. I wasn't there very long, but in that time, I had a couple of roommates but eventually my girlfriend moved in. Anyway, by chance, we met an old friend of mine who had moved away at the grocery. We catch up, and after a few pretty solid days of hanging out, he introduces us to his friend group. One of these people is Aaron. Aaron was a decade older than the rest of us, but he was a big gamer, loved D&D, comics, fantasy novels, Star Wars, anime, etc., and was basically the older brother of that friend group, who were a bunch of 20-something nerds. My wife and I hit it off with him really well. Despite my description of him, he was a pretty charismatic guy. Well, after hanging out for a few weeks, he'd mentioned that he was the super of the building he lived in and that his parents owned the place. He let us know that the apartment across the hall from his was opening up soon and we jumped at the opportunity to get out of the hellhole we lived in. About a month later, we were neighbors. Things started out fine. Aaron was recently divorced and his son, Ethan lived with him full time. In the beginning, he worked at the local KFC and he got free rent from his parents. All he needed to pay was utilities. Well, for whatever reason, he was let go from KFC. From that point on, Aaron wouldn't have a job for the next four years. Now, I'm not going to disparage anyone for not having a job. It's happened to me. However, Aaron was more than capable of working. He just didn't. Instead, he played a lot of games, especially MMOs. He was always hitting up his guildies for cash or gifts. However, this got to the point where people would stop playing with him altogether. During this time, he'd often hit me and my wife up for money and gifts as well. On top of that, any time we'd head to the groceries, he'd hand us gift cards and things and expect us to bring him home food too. Literally every time. I live in a very walkable city and don't drive, so we'd be carrying back food for this guy and his kid. Anytime we didn't, he'd throw a huge tantrum and talk about how we were taking food out of his son's mouth or punishing him for being a parent. Because my wife and I are child-free, he'd say we didn't understand because we hated kids. We don't hate kids, mind, and little Ethan was basically like a nephew to us. Every once in a while, he'd also convince some of our driving mutual friends to take him on grocery runs, but those only happened maybe two or three times per friend because they wouldn't put up with him like we would. That all came to a head when he tried to guilt trip some of our friends on stream at 1am for not dropping everything to drive across town, pick him up, and buy him dinner. Yes, buy him dinner. This is three days after they bought him a $300 gaming chair because his fat ass broke his bet and driving across town to build it for him too. When I say his fat ass, I really mean it too. He was pushing 500 pounds. Now, I'm pretty heavy myself, a lot of my friends and family are. I completely get it. However, one of the things he did was constantly eat out. Really big meals at buffets or ordering multiple pizzas, stuff like that. He said he liked cooking, but he basically never did. This did not help his weight and it very much didn't help his budget. During this time he was always asking my wife to watch Ethan while he went out to who knows where. We're talking 5 minutes 10 hours at a time, sometimes for days on end. She saw Ethan more than Aaron did. We were there for diaper changes, baths, potty training, meals, all of it. My wife basically raised him. All of this without pay other than him occasionally buying us some food. Because his divorce was insanely bad, he was super depressed all the time. He was allergic to mushrooms, so he would always say as soon as Ethan was graduated, going to buy some magic mushrooms and end it all. Really messed up stuff like that. His place was always torn up as well. The grossest place I've ever seen and he'd convince my wife and me to clean it for him. Once again using his son as a guilt trip. Somewhere along the line, he had let Ethan pee all over the floor and spill juice and stuff, so his carpeted floor was always covered in mildew. The bathroom was a wreck as well, covered in human waste, grime, and more. There were also toys and trash everywhere. Both he and his son slept on mattresses on the floor as well because they had to get rid of their bed frames. Why you may ask? Because of the bed bugs. These bed bugs plagued our building for years but he wouldn't report them to his parents because he said they'd kick him out if he did. He had a washer and dryer provided by his parents, but the dryer broke about two years after we moved in, 
and he wouldn't report it to his parents for the same reason. This meant that he and his son wore wrinkled, mildewed clothes all the time. It got to the point where he convinced my wife to take their clothes whenever she went to the laundromat too. Somewhere along the line, he got bitten by a spider on his leg, which nearly had to be amputated due to necrotizing. Luckily, after making all these plans with us to take care of him throughout his recovery, his leg was intact. However, he would then go on to use his rotting leg to milk more sympathy out of everyone around him. Thankfully, his dad ended up hiring him to be a car washer to bring in a bit of money here and there. Don't get me wrong. His parents were abusive assholes, I get it. But after working there one year, he got into a huge fight with his dad about being late all the time and quit. At this point, his dad also started charging rent. Because of that whole debacle, we started making big meals for both households, all while still providing free grocery pickups, childcare, laundry service, cleaning, etc. By this time, Ethan was in school as well, so my wife would walk him to and from before taking care of him in the evening. We also started giving them $500 divided by Mo to help him get back on his feet, with the promise he'd look for a job. Right out of the gate, he said he wouldn't do anything that had him on his feet because of the rotting leg, but he also wouldn't work a temp job or at a call center. Also, because of not driving, it had to be within walking distance, but not too far because of the leg and his weight, so the only jobs he could do were online. So, instead of looking for data entry or something, he decided he wanted to be a streamer. Fuck me. That summer, his AC broke along with his oven. Again, instead of reporting it to his dad, the landlord who was responsible for these things, he begged me and my wife to pay for the fixes. Well, around this time, I got an offer to move into an apartment complex literally only three miles away that was exclusively for artists. I was a full-time artist, so this was a huge opportunity for me. Well, guess what? He started guilt-tripping me and my wife about it, saying that if we moved away, he'd never see us again and that we were being unfair to Ethan. Three miles, that's all. Honestly, I guess he was right, but I'm getting ahead of myself. By this time, all of my friends had had enough of him. They figured he was fun enough to hang out with, but he started being a dick to all of them too. Like, for instance, storming out of multiple D&D games because he didn't like how they were going and not playing for months before coming back like nothing ever happened and then doing it all again. No one but me and my wife would even talk to him after all that. So, knowing what an opportunity moving into this artist collective would be, my friends had an intervention with me. They explained that I was being manipulated, and that instead of helping him and his son, I was being an enabler, and that I needed to move and support my family. Well, with much protest from Aaron, we moved. However, I would still go for visits, and my wife still occasionally sat for Ethan. We also still paid him $500 divided by Mo. That was, until I gave him a cookbook about cooking on a budget, and he lost his shit. I told him that I really wasn't comfortable with him wasting all the money I gave him on junk food and that he should at least try to cook healthy for him and his son. At this point, Ethan was getting bullied for being overweight and his teachers had started saying things. I told Aaron that I wasn't going to enable him and that if he wanted my help, he was going to need to make changes. He was furious saying I was just like his dad and that he was going to do whatever he wanted with his money, and that if I stopped paying him that I was abusing his child. He told me that if I was going to do that, he'd never speak to me again, and that that would be unfair to Ethan. I straight up told him that that was bull, and that we can still be in each other's lives, but at this point I felt I needed to remove money from the equation, and he told me that I was making this decision to never see him again. But that was enough. I told him to have a good life. A few years later I got a phone call from him asking about helping him get into his Minecraft account but I couldn't help. And also I got a message from Ethan asking if we could see each other. I literally still get stress nightmares about him nearly a decade later. I know that a lot of this was my fault for not setting boundaries, but I didn't know that at the time. I'm just trying to move on now. And that move I made. Best thing I've ever done. The collective helped support my indie game studio, so we're doing good things and now I'm the property manager for the building and I also manage their community gallery. Seriously life-changing stuff. I hope this was a good post. If you'd like more about Aaron, like the time he bashed a door into my head repeatedly because I wouldn't take Ethan to the movies on our adults-only trip despite his sister agreeing to babysit, let me know. Thanks for reading. TLDR, many years ago, I moved in next to a friend shortly after high school. He became unemployed and guilted me and my wife into giving him $500 divided by Mo, free childcare, gifts and more because of sob stories about his shitty life and ex. He tried doing this to a bunch of our mutual friends, but they all saw through the manipulation. 
my wife and I had yet to develop healthy boundaries, so we enabled him for years until we moved thinking we were helping him, cut him out of our life and now we're in a healthier place now. Edit. Here are a few common things that have come up in the comments here. 1. CPS was involved. Ethan was considered a happy, healthy kid and CPS has limited resources. Aaron didn't beat him, didn't even spank him. Compared to most of their cases, CPS was fine with all this. They just gave lists of things to be improved that always were by their next visit. Yes, Aaron was a shitty, shitty person, but low on the totem pole by CPS standards. 2. The reason I put up with this is largely because this started basically right after high school for me. Up until that point, I was living with my own abusive, narcissistic mother. Aaron made us feel like he was family and, before we knew it, I'd slipped back into a similar situation like the one I was in with my mother. Abuse sucks and doesn't always make sense unless you've lived it. As for my wife, her story is her own and I won't speak on it. 3. This was many years ago. Now that we're out, my wife and I have had therapy and have grown to the point where we can set boundaries and cut out parasites like Aaron and my mom out of our lives. We've moved on. 4. I didn't post this for sympathy or pity. This was a lifetime ago for me. I posted it because I recently dove into listening to a bunch of these narrated on YouTube and they reminded me of my former situation and I hoped you guys would get something out of hearing my account the way I've gotten something out of listening to others. Story 2. My psycho mother SHTS herself at her cousin's wedding. Hello, Reddit fam. I'm back with another story about my crazy mother who I called Light Switch but I think I want to give her a different nickname. I decided on Beelzebich, as she is a literal demon in human form. I heard someone say that on TikTok and thought it sounded better so I'm gonna go with that. A quick update on my life. I'm still in the process of fixing up my apartment how I like it. My kids are doing well and I am officially divorced. I'm working a lot and bringing in some decent income. I'm also going to the gym three times a week while doing some home exercises on the other days and starting on the keto diet. I'm hoping to lose at least 40 pounds so I can squeeze into some cuter clothes. I've already lost a couple of pounds so that's a win for me. Anyway, on to the story. This happened when I was in my early 20s. My mother's cousin Mary was getting married. She wanted me, Beelzebich, my sister and a couple other female relatives to be in her wedding party. Beelzebich hated the idea of being a bridesmaid. Whenever we would go do wedding planning stuff, she would complain the entire time. She hated the bridesmaid dresses, the hair and makeup ideas and had a meltdown over the shoes. My sister who was very much the carbon copy of Beelzebich would also throw fits. I didn't really like much of Mary's ideas either but I went along with it because I wanted to support her. She was mostly wheelchair bound and could only walk for a short amount of time before she got winded and had to sit down again. I can't lie. The bridesmaid dresses were pretty fucking ugly. A pale army green, short sleeves with a camouflage sash around the waist. They were cut just below the knee and the shoes were combat boots. Mary's husband is military so they were going with a military style theme. Our hair had to be done up in a donut bun on the back of the head. Hair flat against the scalp and the makeup had to be minimal. Despite the bridesmaids hating it, Mary loved it. That was all that mattered but Beelzebich wouldn't let it go. Her aunt had to rein her in on several occasions and remind her that this was Mary's day and not hers. I can't really blame Beelzebich and my sister for hating the dress and shoes but they should have just sucked it up like the rest of us. The lack of flowers was an even bigger problem. Instead of flower arrangements, Mary and Kyle went with black painted jars filled with sticks with a model tank sitting beside it as the centerpieces and dog tags as gifts to send home with the guests. Kyle has a huge collection of models that he put together and painted himself. It was his one hobby he enjoyed. On the sides of the aisle were fake rifles lining it with pale green paper streamers. It was ugly but again, it was Kyle's and Mary's day so what they wanted, they got. The day of the wedding, we were scheduled to get our hair and makeup done at a small salon a few blocks away from the American Legion where the wedding was taking place. My bun was so tight, I got a temporary brow lift and a headache. I noticed right away that Beelzebich and Beelzebrat were nowhere in sight. I called the house, trying to get a hold of them but they didn't answer. It was already close to wedding time and we were all starting to get a bit panicky. Mary was looking lovely in her wedding gown but she too noticed Beelzebich and Beelzebrat were missing and began to get upset. Finally at less than 30 minutes until wedding time, they both rolled in and we all looked at them horrified. Beelzebrat was wearing a bright neon pink dress, black high heels, big hair and bright, loud makeup. Beelzebich was even more horrifying. 
She was wearing a pale gray dress. It was so pale that it could be mistaken for a wedding dress. She was drunk, clutching a cocktail in her hand and laughing to herself when she saw how upset Mary was. Mary began to cry, getting really upset. I do not advocate for violence but this is one instance where I wanted to strangle her. I didn't need to as Tammy woke up and had chosen violence that day. She grabbed Beelzebich by her arm and forced her into a chair. She told her and Beelzebrat that they both will change into the dresses Mary had paid for and get their hair and makeup done the way Mary wanted and if they didn't, she would personally see to it that the two of them end up being dragged with the cans behind Kyle and Mary's car after the wedding and prayed that they went onto a highway for the most painful experience of their lives. The rest of us sat in stunned silence, not wanting to get on that woman's bad side. Beelzebich began to whine but relented after the threat of being smacked around by Tammy. We barely made it on time as it was less than a few minutes out from the time the wedding started. I walked with my escort down the aisle as the music began to play. Beelzebich was so petulant about the whole thing that she was tugging on her escort's arm and acting belligerent. She was loudly commenting on the decor, calling it hideous and insulting people as she walked by them. The poor groomsman has my respect for enduring her behavior for the few minutes that he was escorting her down the aisle. She stood behind me and Beelzebrat soon followed. Once all of us were lined up in our respected places, Kyle walked down the aisle dressed in his formal military uniform. He looked so happy. That was until Beelzebich began to make comments about how stupid he was for marrying a cripple and being stuck with her. I snuck a look over at Tammy who was fuming and looked like she wanted to punch Beelzebich in the face. She told her to shut the fuck up or else. Beelzebich's laughter and wily grin soon shifted into a sneer. I whispered back at her, begging her to cut it out. When Mary was coming down the aisle, her father was pushing her in her wheelchair. Beelzebich began to groan, grunting and sounding like she was in pain. I looked back at her and her face was as red as a tomato. I whispered, asking if she was okay and she didn't say anything. I looked over at Tammy who was glaring daggers at her and waiting for an excuse to knock her out. Once Mary got to the end of the aisle, her father helped her to stand and Kyle helped to hold her up so the priest could begin. As the priest was talking, I heard the most disgusting sound behind me. It was so loud that the priest lost focus and went silent. It was as if a bomb had exploded and the smell that followed it began to fill the air. Beelzebrat and the other bridesmaids behind her began shrieking. I turned around and looked at Beelzebich and then looked down. Her legs and the floor surrounding her was splattered with soupy, diarrhea shit. Mary was so horrified by the situation that she nearly collapsed and had to be helped into her wheelchair. Beelzebich was acting fake, pretending to be embarrassed, overly exaggerating even by shitting herself and looked around and asked for some assistance in cleaning herself up. She looked at the groomsman who escorted her and in a sickeningly sweet voice asked if he would volunteer. He looked like he wanted the ceiling to cave in on him. She looked so satisfied with what she did, that she was grinning ear to ear to see everyone causing a fuss over her, not a shred of remorse. Tammy was so fed up that she sucker punched Beelzebich square in the jaw and the two of them got into a brawl. Other guests had to break them up. The police were called and much to her real shock and humiliation, Beelzebich was escorted out. She tried to argue but Kyle told her he wanted her gone. Beelzebich and Beelzebrat both looked at me as I was going too. Kyle insisted I stay. Some of us vomited from the smell because it was that bad. I like to think I have a strong stomach but this was otherworldly. We all pitched in to clean up the mess. By the time we were done, Mary and Kyle were nowhere to be found. Tammy found them outside, Mary in tears and Kyle holding her. I apologized profusely for my mother's behavior. I offered to pay to have the rug professionally cleaned as it had been a gift from a late colonel who had been a patron there some years ago. I know a simple steam clean would have gotten the job done just fine but I wanted to show just how sorry I was for Beelzebich making the day all about herself and ruining such a precious thing. They said it wasn't necessary. Once the smell cleared out, we were able to continue the wedding. The reception was quiet and we all ate in silence. Once I got home that night, Beelzebich was giving me the silent treatment. I found her on the couch, drinking whiskey and glaring at the wall. Her bridesmaid dress and boots were stuffed into the trash and the dress was shredded like it had been butchered with scissors. Beelzebrat called me a bitch and said I was a traitor because I didn't support our mother. I told her that I can't support someone who would purposefully shit themselves just to take the spotlight off a bride on her wedding day. My brother who wasn't at the wedding broke my stereo by spiking it right onto the pavement outside. Tammy spread the news to everyone on that side of the family. Much of our family cut communication with her after that. She would get angry and embarrassed if anyone brought it up. She maintained for years that it was an accident but anyone who was there and saw what happened knew she did it on purpose, out of spite and because she couldn't stand the day not being about her. 
She was never invited to any weddings in the family after that. Every time someone in the family announced their wedding online, she would whine about not getting an invite but they would remind her of what she did and it being why she would not be invited to another wedding until she can learn how to act like a human being and not a wild animal, an attention-seeking asshole. Spoiler alert, she never did. I still talk to Mary and Kyle now and again. They are doing well. Kyle is retired from active duty and serves as a drill sergeant. They aren't able to have kids of their own due to Mary's condition but they are foster parents to three boys and a girl. Super happy for them and glad they are doing well. Anyway, that's it for that story. I'll be back with another soon. Story 3. My brother wants my GF so bad. I have been a caretaker for my brother, Justin, since he was 10. I was only 16 when our parents died. I had to take care of the household because my brother was still very little. I did everything for him. He was the apple of my eye. I guess I spoiled him a lot. I never dated that much because I was the breadwinner for my brother. That is until I met Melissa, it was almost 10 years ago. We dated for 2 years. It was great, my brother loved her. One day, I eavesdropping a conversation she was having with her friend. The gist of that conversation was something like her friend was asking about me. Melissa said that she loves me a lot, she loves that I take care of her in every way. But I am pretty average when it comes to having sex. Her friend asked her if she is going to talk to me about it or how is she happy. She told her that her fixture is my brother. She went on to explain how she and Justin have been having an affair for 8 months. She thinks it is justified because she thinks Justin is better in bed than I am. You can imagine how painful it was for me. I went inside the house pretending I didn't hear a thing. I confronted Justin about it. I know how get him to talk. I pressed this matter after he was denying it. He eventually broke down and said it was the truth. He didn't say anything because he didn't want to hurt me. He and Melissa are in love and wanted to get married but Melissa won't leave me. I was furious. I wanted to beat the shit out of him but I just told him he is dead to me and left. I also kicked out Melissa and she stayed with my brother and his roommates. My brother was banging on my door non-stop. I had to move in with a friend and told everyone to not disclose my location to my brothers. His calls and emails were all the same that he was sorry and he never wanted to hurt me and he will break up. I stopped the bank account that I mad made for him that he can access when he is 25. He was not my brother anymore. I went into deep depression. I didn't eat or sleep properly. I would have nightmares of my brother and ex laughing at me that I suck in bed. And if I was good enough she would have never left me. It got so bad that once I stood in front of a train track because it was too unbearable for me. Luckily, my friends saved me. I do not have much friends but they were my rock. I stayed with them for a year. I went to therapy, I did group sessions. I had a lot of anxiety regarding intimacy so I didn't date for a long time. My friend encouraged me to try. I did try once with a one night stand but it was bad for both of us. I still go to therapy to this day. But other aspects of my life has improved. I focused more on building new relationships with new people. I went to travel and explore more hobbies. I was living for myself. I am in a relationship with someone for three years now. We are engaged and we are having a kid together. Wendy is a really nice person. She knows all about my insecurities and problems that I faced because of my brother. She was mature and patient with me. I was able to trust someone enough to be in a relationship. Two days ago, I got an invitation in my mail about a wedding. And as the title says it was from my brother. He has kept tabs on me from afar and invited me to his wedding with none other than Melissa. Looking at their names doesn't hurt that much now. I feel numb. If it was 8 years ago, I would have a meltdown. I still feel this pain that I cannot be happy for my brother's big day. My fiancé suggests that we shouldn't go and delete the invite. Relevant comments. Comment. I wouldn't have been as strong as you, man. I'm in shock and inner rage of the heartless people who hurt you. I could never imagine how horrible this must have made you feel. Opus replied, There is nothing more I want than to watch them suffer. I have no love or blessing left for him. When my parents died they told me to look after him and then when we are adult we will look after each other. He threw it all away. It doesn't hurt that Melissa cheated. It hurts more that my own brother has cheated me. Update July 5th, 2023 Hello guys, I was thinking about making an update soon. I know people in Reddit really likes updates, but I delayed it because I have a baby girl now. When I posted this my fiancé was already 8.5 months pregnant. We had an early delivery. My baby girl, Emily, is so cute. She is a little bundle of joy for both of us. She is so tiny and cute. She has eyes just like mine. I cannot believe we made something so precious. I spent as much as time holding her. My wife gets pissed because she thinks I am going to coddle her to death. Also my fiancé and I got married pretty quickly. It was a court marriage. Neither of us wanted a big wedding anyways. We are all fine. 
some of you asked me how my brother knew my address. Well, he didn't. He only knew my email, my work email. He probably knows what company I go to so from there he tracked down my email and sent an invitation. A few days ago, I get another email from my brother. I have forgot to block him. I usually don't check my work email because most of them are forwarded in Slack. My brother made a huge ass email. He basically told me he knows I will not come to his wedding but still wanted me there for his big day. He apologized for what he has done and that he would never forgive himself for doing wrong. He knew he shouldn't have slept with Melissa, but he did it anyways. Growing up he had been jealous of me. He was jealous that I am the more capable brother who is just babysitting him. When Melissa approached him, he felt like he has more importance. He knew he was wrong. He wanted to stop. The day I said he was dead to me, he had a panic attack. He tried his best to contact me but my friends refused to give up my location. He was begging them. He and Melissa split up for a while. He was desperate to find me. He hit rock bottom when he heard from a friend of his that I tried to commit suicide. Even his friends judged him harshly after what he has done. His friends saw me as a big brother too, so they all refused to be at his wedding with Melissa. Melissa and he reconciled two years ago. By that time Melissa was a single mom. She feels guilty about what she has done because the father of her child has cheated on her and left her. She also wanted to meet me and say sorry. From there they rekindled their romance. Lastly, he said he cannot go through with the wedding. He called it off and he fought with Melissa and they broke up again. He wants me to be with him in his most important day. He knows I have disowned him, but he is willing to do anything to reconcile, even if it takes him his whole life. That's it. There was bunch of whining stuff that I ignored. I deleted the email. My therapist said, forgiveness isn't something that is forced. It comes from subconscious level when we know we can forgive that person. And it should be an option only when someone shows that they are sorry by their actions and not by their words. Honestly, I don't want to. I know I am being petty and cruel but I am happy the way my life is. Adding him will cause stress. My wife told me to forget it. My brother is not guilty at all. As soon as I forgive him, he would go back to Melissa. He needs to figure out his life his own. I have babied him enough. Now it is his turn to be an adult. Edit. People asking me if my brother's life so I want to clear it out. I do not have any idea what he has been doing with his life. I moved away from my place further from him. I transferred my job too. He must have known my place of work from where he got the email. For 10 years of my life I pretended he doesn't exist along with therapy. I treated him like he was someone dead. I don't know what went down with him and Melissa, but from his email I can paint a picture that they broke up after dating few years. His friends were unhappy with him dating this woman, and they decided to drop the wedding because of Melissa. My brother told me he doesn't want to get married unless I am there to support him. That could be anyone, doesn't have to be Melissa. Why Melissa came back I don't know. Maybe she thought I would accept her like a doormat but she knows me better than that. I am stubborn when it comes to holding grudge. I didn't know I had an impact on his friends so much. They were good people who would hang out with us. Though they were younger they treated me like their own brother. I did get apologies from two of his friends who never had a positive male role model after I blocked my brother. I don't have any contact with them. Relevant comments. Comment 1. While Opus your brother is facing the consequences for his actions harshly, but every choice we make has a price and he should have known that when he was meeting your ex behind your back. I don't blame you at all. Melissa got what she deserved. Her ex cheating on her is her karma for having slept with your brother. You've done so much for him and I think that if he truly regrets what he did to you he will get back on his own feet without asking for your help. I wonder how he even had the audacity to invite you to the wedding with his now ex knowing how much both of them hurt you. You were right for not attending. Forgiveness can't be forced. Whenever you think you're ready to forgive him you will if not then not. I don't judge you for not forgiving him. Opus replied. If he truly regretted this he wouldn't have decided to marry Melissa, the woman who destroyed my life along with my brother. What did he think? I will forget all the pain and trauma they have caused me. Forgiveness doesn't set you free. It creates a different trap. Over the years I have learned forgiveness is a tool made by cowards who just wants to get away with their wrongdoings without facing any consequences. They think having forgiveness removes the toll of guilt they have. True forgiveness is never forced, it is earned. He still has done nothing to earn that. 